Hi. Um, you know what's awesome? Awesome is that Best of Baltics track is back for third year. It's a tradition in our event. But you know what's even more awesome? If you invested in every company in the Best of Baltics track, three years back, two years back, and even this year, you would have incredibly profitable portfolio. You would have already unicorn in your portfolio. So um, I'm super dedicated to, um, to come back uh, when batch by batch all companies are exited and tell you what, what the return could have been. But, but first of all, we'll, um, we'll do a quick overview about the Baltic startup scene. And um, I need a presentation um, that gives, gives us statistics. Um, so, quick snapshot. Um, we have looked into Crunchbase data. In total, there are 1,800 startups in Baltic countries. Estonia, 828. Uh, Latvia, uh, 400. Lithuania, somebody evil has deleted Lithuania. Actually, it was there before. But you know what's good? I know Lithuania numbers by heart. It's 570. Uh, that, that Lithuania has. Interesting how some numbers disappear. Um, and uh, when, when we look at uh, how much were added uh, during last year, then uh, in total 361. Estonia 120, uh, Latvia 97. Lithuania was about 120, 21 in, in that range. So pretty similar amount of companies, new companies in, in the Baltic scene. Since 2010, Baltic startups have raised over 1.5 billion. And um, it actually, most of it, 58% of it has happened during the last two years. So there is a major attention to Baltic startups or Baltic related startups. And, and they have been very successfully fundraised. Uh, 49 companies have raised over, over 2 million. But obviously, 2080 rule, you know, 80% uh, uh, of the funding has, has been raised by, by 20 uh, top companies. Now, uh, last year in funding, uh, it was record year uh, based on crowdsourced data, where every startup records everything. Um, there was like significant increase in, in the funding. Um, Estonia growing a bit, Latvia uh, doing probably average over a long time, Lithuania also a um, major jump actually compared to, to previous years. And, um, and if you look at the scene, I mean, you can imagine how hard it was to start something in 2012, 2013. Uh, but these were exactly the times where most of the startups who are raising now major rounds were started. They were not afraid of, you know, no funding available, very little funding available. Um, we, we last year we also looked at the top 20, and um, there are two newcomers. Uh, one is CTB, Alice Venen, and the other one is Realize, uh, joining the top 20 most financed um, startups. And as you see, almost half of the top companies actually have raised, um, raised more money. A few years back, um, there was only a couple of names on the whole venture scene in Baltic countries. Now you see like quite a lot of names. Um, the latest newcomer, definitely Nordic Ninja. Um, and there has been a lot of questions like, is it overheated? Is there too much capital? And I would say, we are just only getting to the normal situation where good founder can have several term sheets on the table. Good founder has a chance to choose a fund where he really or she really has a partnership feeling with the investor versus to have one or two choices only and take it or leave it. So the market is only getting to the normal place where actually more value can, can be built. And, and you see, you know, number of investors, uh, very familiar names to you who already have done deals in politics. What's the very latest trend is uh, uh, quite many investors coming to Estonia contact us. Um, we met them maybe for the first time. And, and reasonably often we hear we already have done deal in Estonia. 
So um, I think next year will be will be many more new funds uh, doing doing deals in Baltics because the inbound interest is is really significant. Can we have exits? 34 exits since 2010. Estonia 18, Latvia 11, Lithuania 5, and uh, we, we see very, um, very, very uh, large strategic companies being interested in acquiring Baltic startups. And um, our focus in Karma Ventures is very much based on deep tech and, and strong technologies. We see that uh, wherever the company is located, uh, strategic interest is always there if the technology and the technology team is very strong. So, um, so while quite many European investors complain that there are not many exits, then based on our experience, deep tech sector is doing in Europe very well. In Karma Ventures, we have looked into uh, 3,000 different startups in the last three years. We roughly get 1,000 deals per year uh, coming in, or we are reaching out to startups. And 16% of them have been from, from Baltic countries. And, um, and, you know, going through our filters, um, we have looked at 3,000 companies in our process. When the deal is quite advanced, all our team meets, meets a startup. There has been like 81 meetings. And out of these 81 meetings, we have done so far in three years 12 investments, out of which six are, are companies based in, in, in Baltic countries. Also in our um, deal flow, we have looked uh, what is the usual ask from Baltic countries for, for seed, pre-seed, seed, series A, and so on. Um, you know, first of all, the deal flow we, we see in Estonia, we see much more seed phase at the moment uh, versus Latvia and Lithuania. But if you look at the A round opportunities, they are very, very equal. Um, and average ask, um, we can imagine, you know, they are pretty much equal across all, all, all countries. But what we see uh, asks in seed phase have, have really increased lately. And, and also it's, it's related to more experience, uh, more serial entrepreneurs, more funding available. So um, it is better match between what needs to be built and what type of funding is available. So. Uh, so Estonian seed ask, for example, is, is around 1 million at the moment, what, what we see. Series A average ask is 3 million, um, definitely smaller ask than we usually see in German, UK, definitely much more than the US. Um, might be rated to lower cost base uh, and, and, and operations cost, um, but maybe there is something, something else behind it as well. Good, this is our team, the team that in my life I have enjoyed working most ways. It's incredibly good people. Whenever you see them around, they always love to talk to you as well. Now, today we have seven startups. And best of Baltic track is not pitching, trying to sell you. It is not like trying to convince you. It is just telling their story. What it has been, how founders have felt building it up, what might be the challenges. So um, the first company, Coming up is Leapin and Colin. Please join head of marketing in, in Leapin. Thanks, Marcus. Do I need that um, pointer? <laughs> the power. There we go. Everyone hear me okay? Awesome. Hi, guys. I'm Colin. I'm the CMO at Leapin. Um, I just want to talk to you about a quiet revolution that's currently happening that's going to affect all of our lives over the next decade. Um, but before I get to that, I want to share two things with you. First thing is um, the two fears that I have, right? So the first fear that I have is my mother saying my full name to me. That terrifies me. And the second thing that I'm afraid of is a room full of people staring at me just after lunch. So you're going to have to bear with me. Um, I want to make a confession. I am not a founder of Leapin. Um, but I have founded a technology company before, about five years ago, and I exited it last year. So I know the pains of growing a business. I know what's required there. And it's hard, right? Growing a business is very, very difficult. It's difficult when you're at five people. It gets easier, but it's still really hard when you're at 50. But I want you to now imagine what it's like to run a business completely on your own. So a little bit of audience participation here. 
Can you put your hands up in the air if you have founded a company or you are currently running a company? There's got to be a few of you in the audience, yeah? Okay, great. I want you to keep your hands in the air now if you are doing that or you have done that completely on your own. That's quite a few. Okay, so you're not alone. There's 162 million solopreneurs in the US and the EU. That's right now. That's people who are doing business on their own. They are building business on their own. We look to service around 40 million of those globally. So those are people that are doing professional services. So they're fr freelancer website designers to um, translators. They're contractors to consultants. It's a massive, massive market. In fact, I want you to think of it as a, as a nation, a virtual nation. And if it was a virtual nation, it would have an economic output of around 2 trillion euros. And it's growing three times quicker, three times quicker than any other nation on Earth. And the great thing here is they don't have the advantage of being able to create babies. If you're part of that nation, you're someone who decided to become part of it. And the reason you've decided to become part of it is highly likely because we're becoming more entrepreneurial. Evidence of that, really clear. Solopreneurs going up, number of traditional workers going down. In fact, by 2027, in the US, there'll be a seismic shift in how the economy works. There will be, for the first time, more people running their own business than working for someone else. And that's huge. It's massive, but the opportunity is great, right? This opportunity is huge. But businesses don't really care about solopreneurs. They either don't care or they don't know what the opportunity is. These people feel misunderstood, underserved, undervalued. And most of them are willing to pay, 90% nearly, significantly more for people to build products for them. So there's a huge opportunity. And that's the reason why Leapin was created, to be this operating system for those, those people, those freelancers, those contractors, those solopreneurs, those business people that are really driving a change, a silent revolution in the economy. We want to service that digital nation. And we do that in three ways. So we deal with the hard stuff, the bits that nobody wants to do, because nobody ever decided after doing their taxes or completing a VAT return or putting in expenses to, you know what, I'm going to quit my job and start my own business. They do it because they love doing what they do, and they provide value to their customers. So what we try and do is take away those hassles, those hard bits, company formation, tax and accounting, and banking. We roll them all into one platform, and we do that for you so that you don't have to engage with government. You don't have to think about it, and you save a lot of money, and you save a lot of time. Now, we build this at the moment on the uh, Estonian e-residency platform, which means that those 40 million customers that we talked around the world can become e-residents, and from anywhere in the world, doesn't matter where they are, they can service their customers. Nice and simple, nice and easy. In fact, we have a brand promise. Our promise is that we will do it 10 times quicker for half the price, and will be just as trusted as what you're currently using today. And from that promise, we've developed a monthly recurring revenue of around 150,000 euros. So when we say 10 times quicker, what do we really mean? Well, it currently takes the average person two days to do their administration, OK? It's not the thing that they do their business for. We'll cut that down to two hours. Two hours a month will save you. That, that's what you'll do, saving you two days a month. Now think about what you could use that time for, growing your business, servicing your customers, spending time with family, chilling out on a beach. And our customers are from all over the world. Admittedly, we have a large group in Europe. That's because we're based here. But we have customers on every continent, except for Antarctica, but the Wi-Fi is a little flaky there. And our customers love what we do. We have an NPS score of positive 71. We get two marriage proposals every single month. It's strange, but people do it. So we're fulfilling that element of trust and exceeding it. And just to recap, on what we just talked about, solopreneurs. What does that really mean? These independent people that are working in a market growing three times quicker with an economic output of two trillion euros spread across every country in the world. This is what we're servicing. And this is the virtual nation that we're building at Leapin. Thank you. After every presentation, we have a few minutes for questions as well. Be kind. Colin, you... I'm not. <laughs> uh, I, I'll start. So, um, so, so, so you joined Leap in like 
one month ago or so. Yeah, five weeks ago. Having done like uh, several startups successfully in in UK, and now joining Estonian startup, I'm not asking like what's wrong with you, but uh, <laughs> what what is the reason actually to take a look at Estonian startup? You know, join it, traveling a lot, yeah. contributing a lot for the company who is based here. Sure, it, it helps that I live really close to an airport, which is super important when you're traveling to Estonia every week. Um, but the real advantage, I think, is that there's a certain attitude, right? It goes down to sort of culture. So what do Estonians and what do people from the Baltic region have that perhaps is lacking elsewhere in, in Europe? And I think it's this attitude to get things done. There's an urgency. They want to do things now. I mean, it goes down to the whole, just say what you're thinking, rather than talking around the fringe. Um, and for me, that, that means that we can do things that other companies can't do for less. Um, and that really attracted me, the talent. So, so it was actually pretty much the question I wanted to ask next. Uh, in another portfolio company of ours, uh, head of sales joined from UK. And the Estonian team asks him, asked him, like, please be direct when you talk to Estonians. <laughs> and the guy from UK thought, OK, now I'm direct. I'm as direct as I can. And when he started talking, Estonian said, we <coughs> ask you to be direct. <laughs> so yeah. have you learned to be direct? I'm learning. Yeah, I'm definitely learning. Um, small talk doesn't really exist, uh, I'd say, for the, for the majority. I think if Estonians wrote Game of Thrones, it would have been two series instead of eight. <laughs> <Okay>. so, <laughs> but it would have been just as good. Good one. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Any questions from the audience? Um, any details you'd like to hear? Yes? Uh, uh, Microphone is coming. <clears throat> Thank you. I have a question. What's your personal goal in the company? Personal goal in the company? Um, I would very much like us to grow to be a million customers spread across the whole world. That's what I would like to see us do. Personal growth with that and helping the business to achieve that via my, my area of expertise, which is marketing. Kid, any other questions? Yes, one more. I'm a happy Leapin customer for almost two years now. And I've, <laughs> I've seen something new on this uh, very last spreadsheet, the Republic of Leapin, uh, where you showed all that flags and that uh, raised a question in me, uh, are you doing some steps towards bringing all these customers also not only to you, but together? Potentially, yeah. I mean, without going into too much detail, um, at the moment we have so many customers from so many different countries with all very different needs, but one thing they have in common is they want to grow their businesses and they want to they work in the simplest way possible. So with that shared need, yeah, possibly, you should see new products being developed and released over the next year, and they'll be quite exciting. It looks like you're doing real uh, revolution. So, so, uh, your citizens would like to come together. Yeah. Something new is really happening. Definitely, yeah. It's a shared sort of motivation. People want to be doing something. Yeah. You see that, it's growing. Great. Thank you, Colin. That's fantastic. Thank, Thank you. you. So, um, technology is many fancy things, but technology in agriculture, um, that's something that is a fairly new thing in, uh, in, in, in the venture field. E Agronom, Stenner, please. Um, hello, everybody. Can I have the clicker for slides? Uh -huh. So, uh, hello, everybody. My name is Denver. I'm the founder and COO of Eagonom. Uh, I was invited here to tell you the story of Eagonom and how we got started. So it all started uh, two and a half years ago when Robin showed me his father's farms and a few other farms. Now farms these days, they're real businesses. They have real business problems. They need to manage their employees, financials, logistics, everything that a traditional business needs to do. But the problem is they don't have good tools to achieve those goals. They do everything on pen and paper. In Poland, 70% of Polish farmers use pen and paper for everyday farm management. So that means that they actually spend most of their time gathering the data and doing data entry instead of optimizing their business processes. And the business process optimization is left to somebody who's called an agronomical advisor. But the agronomical advisor is basically just a fertilizer or a chemical salesperson. His salary is tied to depending on how much he sells, not how profitable the farmer is. So naturally, they push farmers towards the maximum amount of yield and revenue instead of the maximum amount of uh, profit. And this cuts into the farmer's profit margin, and it also pollutes the environment a lot. 50% of the Baltic Sea pollution, for example, comes from farming. 
and it's purely because of our fertilization. So yeah, we decided to make a SaaS product for the farmers to really help them out, uh, help them with their business, spend more time with their family, and uh, also, very important for me personally, help the environment through the farmers. So we made a, a software for them. Software that in the winter, can you imagine what the farmer does during the winter? A good farmer. He probably goes to Bahamas, right? But after Bahamas, he actually starts to plan the next year, and he also analyzes the previous year. So we provide them with tools to achieve both. We, they, through our application, they can deal with logistical planning, uh, fertilizer, chemical, financial, crop planning, everything that you need, and they can also compare the fields. Uh, now, can you guess what the farmers do during the season? Uh, raise your hands who uh, has worked in a farm. There are a few hands. Very cool. So during the season, farmers work on the fields. Who would have thought, right? So we help them with tracking their employees, uh, tracking tasks, inventory, and also do all sorts of government reports, which uh, could have taken up to a month if they were doing it with pen and paper. But in our application, it takes one click. So yeah, we started. In six months, we got to 70% of Estonian market. Two and a half year late, uh, years later, we're in nine countries, from Canada to Poland. There's over a million hectares in our system, uh, half of which are paid. That's larger than some countries in the world. So we are managing more area than uh, some countries. Uh, and yeah, uh, there's also a link there, but unfortunately, I can't really click it on this presentation. So I took a picture. That's uh, an image of uh, many of the fields that you see uh, in our application. So even though Poland might look like it has less than Estonia, it actually has about the same it they're just more spread out. And yeah, as you can see from the numbers, it's the nice hockey stick growth. We really worked hard to get all the sales and the uh, machine running, and we have found a model how to approach farmers. Now, this is one of the most difficult tasks to do. The reason why many companies who are very similar to us is that they don't find a way how to get farmers on board. Farmers are very conservative with technology. Uh, some other achievements include that we are being taught in universities in Czech, Latvia, and Estonia. We are the, in 2018, first half, we were the second fastest growing startup by number of employees. Robin was young entrepreneur of the year, etc. And our goal is to become an Amazon for farmers, a single place where farmers can buy everything and create the biggest farming union in the world to give them back the purchasing power. And basically, I help them with AI agronomists and do all sorts of AI predictions. There's lots of cool stuff that's already out there and that we can help them as well because we have exclusive data that nobody else does. We know when seed is put to the soil before anybody can see it from the satellite months before it happens in real time. And using this data, there's some really awesome things we can do that will completely transform the industry that's so far been very traditional. And finally, we have done case studies. And this is very important for me, because personally, I care more about the environment. That's the most important thing to me. And we have case studies showing we have already reduced fertilizer chemical use. Uh, we help farmers save tens to hundreds of thousands of euros. And we help them spend more time with their family. And finally, last Christmas, I called through most important customers we have, and they said, many of them said, uh, that they can finally sleep at night. They go to work after 12 to 16 hour days in harvesting season, and everything is done. They don't need to worry about work, no paperwork. Thank you. Thank you. You did something very, very important that very few founders do. You, you told in the end why it's personally very important for you and its environment and, 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 and what, what you mentioned. But the second thing is what is very important. What you dream about. What it will be in three to five years. How do you imagine your company? What it has achieved? And, and what it has achieved, why that is personally important to you as well. Mm -hmm. So what do you dream about? My dream is that... Uh from the company business perspective, like I said, we want to be the Amazon for farmers, the biggest farming union in the world, 
and used AI to help them make better decisions. There's a lot of very inefficient players out there in that industry, and we can help them to make data-driven decisions. But through that, uh, I want to make sure that our soils stays sustainable, because right now, the erosion of the soil is a huge problem for our society. Uh, we don't know that because we don't see it with our own eye, uh, but actually, every year, the yields uh, of the soil go down and down globally, and uh, we lose good soil every year. And that's a huge problem, and it will bite us in the ass. You're really on a mission. We really need to wish you will, we will do great. But how is it to sell to farmers? Uh, basically, we do... Are they like tech enough to when you show up with your software and tools and so on? So, so we have basically personal outbound sales. And that's accompanied with actually personal account management. We actually go and visit farmers and send account managers to them to give the training. We do group trainings, we do individual trainings. It depends on the farmer, how advanced he is and everything. But uh, we see that this is the only way and the best way because the channel to the farmer is the thing that's actually worth so much. Uh, after we have built this personal relationship, we have a very strong channel to the farmer and every hectare that's in the ground is worth around 500 euros every year, and there's 700 million hectares of cereal land. Good. Any questions? Yes, immediately. Uh, you said the farmers are very conservative. Are the Lithuanian farmers are even more conservative that they are not used your system? Uh, uh, yes, Lithuanian farmers are definitely even more conservative. Uh, <laughs> Some will say that maybe Polish farmers are even more. Uh, and in Poland, we're doing very, very well. In Lithuania, we're not actually focusing on right now. We do have uh, customers from there, but our focus is currently on Estonia, Latvia, Poland, and Romania. And, and do you need to change the mindsets? Or the first thing what you hear is, you know, we have waited for you for, for a century. So, so, so are you, like, have to change the mindsets or Actually, like one of the biggest reasons the customers buy to us, uh, well, not one of the biggest, but many customers do, is they say that they know their son is going to take over the farm. Mm. But unless the farm is in the computer, the son will never take it over. He will abandon the farm because no modern person, young person, wants to work with pen and paper anymore. So a lot of the older generations simply try and push themselves to put it to computers simply to make it more appealing for their, uh, well, hairs, right? And uh, yeah, it's, uh, they're just waiting for somebody who will come with a convincing and good product and uh, convince them to start using it. So your marketing qualified leads inc includes criteria, does the farmer have kids? That is higher <laughs> probability, right? That's very hard to measure. Any other questions? I promised yes. I take a selfie, so sorry. Please do. While microphone is going. Thank you. <laughs> Hi. Uh, what kind of cooperation do you do with the local governments, if any, and how do they support you? Uh, so it depends from country to country. In Estonia, we're actually straight in a BRIA project. And uh, Estonian uh, BRIA, which is the fund that uh, government organization that gives out like grant monies and uh, punishes if they violate rules, they are building an uh, electronical field diary, and we are there to consult them with that. In uh, Lithuania, for example, we made a deal with the government that uh, they, uh, like in there, the farmers need to send a signed document to the government in order to get their field shapes. Uh, and we basically made a deal that uh, we can, they can do it through us. And, but the funny story was the first field shape that they had to send to us after the deal was through we were waiting for a week, and then we sent them an email, like, where is it? Like, uh, it should be here already. And they replied, oh, we already posted the CD, and it's on the way. So <laughs> <laughs> then we were like, you can send it an email as well. It's only one megabyte. <laughs> hey, actually, you took very Estonian selfie. It was you and the audience. Everyone was, like, serious. Do you want to take a new selfie? Oh, that's, that will be yes. perfect. And you, hands up, wave. Help, help this guy to take a great picture. Wow. Much better one. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank Nobody you. believes you did it in Estonia. Thank you so much. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> Great. We have next company coming up. Scoro. 
and head of marketing, Merrily. Hi, everyone. I hope you can hear me all right. So I'm Merrily from Skoro. And before I get into what's happening at Skoro currently, uh, I thought I'd brief, brief you in on the business management sphere and the challenges and the opportunities there. So, uh, yeah, uh, we all know the water cooler chat. Uh, there's also several other uh, forms of communication at work. There's the status update and the good old meeting that could have been an email. Uh, so communication is key at workplace. And uh, SaaS startups have figured it out, and they're competing to take advantage of it. Uh, last year, uh, for example, Slack announced a $250 million investment, boosting their evaluation to more than $5 billion US dollars. Uh, Microsoft is de developing its own chat platform, and so is Facebook. Uh, they're uh, also focusing on the uh, business management tools now. Uh, but a lot of the times when I get an instant message at work, I'm thinking, why did you use chat for this? It's sort of like opening someone's door, barging in, and asking them a question, uh, demanding immediate attention. And actually, it's a huge problem. Uh, a typical worker gets 11 minutes between each interruption, and it takes them 25 minutes to get back to the original task they were tackling. And this rapid toggling between tasks um, actually decreases the quality of work delivered as well. Um, another um, study showed that the test takers, when they were bombarded with different tasks, actually decreased the quality um, by 20%. Uh, this means that, in theory, a B- student will become a failure. And there is no escape from this technology, really. Uh, according to Gartner, 75% of companies uh, use some form of um, instant messaging at work. And in a third of these cases, this is actually sanctioned by the company itself. Um, Slack reportedly adheres to the mission, work, ha work hard, then go home. But they have nonetheless actually created the opposite. Uh, it's more like work half distractedly, then keep doing that no matter where you go. Uh, I think we all know the anxious feeling of when you return from holiday. You check the workplace chat, and there's a ton of messages that you need to catch up with. It's, uh, I think workplace uh, chats are making us um, passively addicted to, the, uh, to work, basically. And I think employers and employees alike are starting to understand that actually it could be doing more harm than uh, good for the companies, because if we're always available, uh, when can we get any work done? And if everything's a high priority, then nothing is really. So our mission in Skoro is actually to tackle this problem. Um, we think that being proactive is more productive than being reactive. Uh, so Skoro is an end-to-end -end business management software uh, that wants to uh, offer an alternative that is always online and as soon as pos possible mentality. And by keeping everything one solution, you can actually get rid of the uh, status update meetings, the quick check-ins, the endless um, email threads and spreadsheets. And the, therefore, the whole team gains in productivity. And um, uh, in Skoro, we basically combine uh, all of the different aspects a business uh, needs. Uh, project and task management, invoicing, client management, um, also reporting. So not only can businesses save money by eliminating a lot of the tools in their current tool stacks, but more importantly, company can uh, create a company-wide um, uh, standard for data and in, therefore in, uh, enhance collaboration as well. So we're a team of more than 70 people now, uh, working in, an in our offices in Tallinn, New York, Riga, and Vilnius. And in a couple of weeks, we're actually opening our new office in London which we're really excited about. Um, in November, just in time for our birthday, we, got a, uh, uh, we closed our A round of funding of uh, $5 million. And we're also leaders in most of the business categories at the Gartner Review Sites Network. We haven't received any marriage proposals like Colin from LinkedIn, but we're still happy with our results there. Um, just recently, we got a Tech 5 award by the Next Web. 
Uh, we're also in the uh, Inc. 5000 list and the Deloitte uh, Tech 50, Fast 50. Uh, and yeah, enough of the humble brag. I thought I'd use this opportunity to let you know that we're hiring. So please check out our careers page. We're always happy to welcome new scorers in the team. And I'll leave you with a quote by the time management guru, David Allen, who's the founder of this getting th things done methodology that we follow in Scoro as well. So thank you. Do you actually know how to avoid all this email, huge amount of emails and chat notifications after coming back from holidays? Uh, I think it takes a strategy. So you need to, like, after coming back from uh, the holiday, you take a week to like catch up with everything and I then get to work. You. Yeah. Don't go to holidays. Yeah. <laughs> That's a way <laughs> That's to avoid. A good <laughs> hint. That's a good hint for so, burnouts. So, 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 <laughs> so looking at your product functionality, I mean, you do everything. And for everything what you do that is a unicorn ahead of you doing one function of it. And you as a head of marketing, how do you message it? Like, how do you shine out of this big ocean of whales, you know, swimming around? And you, how your message comes through to the world? Yeah, it's actually quite difficult because uh, even the tools that don't offer that wide spectrum of features, they still say they do. So it's hard competing with this. But we focus less on the features and more on this holistic approach and uh, more about uh, teaching uh, employees that it's, there's actually another option to work and you don't have to be in five different tools and emails and spreadsheets. So hopefully this message uh, gets through to people. So, so it's again changing mindsets. Yes. The way how you approach work and, and how you do it. So yeah, it's a lot it's about a changing challenge. mindsets. Yeah. You're doing also something uh, you know, which, which, which is very crucial in, 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 in startup lifetime. So you have many customers from US as well, but you, you have started to build the US team. Mm -hmm. So tell us about, like, when did you figure out now it's time to build, you know, the US team who is selling in the US, take the cost, take the risk, if it works out or not. And what's your kind of, you know, initial results, comments, lessons learned? Yeah, actually, whenever we enter a new market, such as London for now, uh, and also when we started in the US, uh, we never go there without doing our research, obviously. So uh, in London, we currently have already 130 customers. Uh, that's our proof of concept there. So we know that it's obviously a drop in the ocean, but when we have a, a place in, uh, when we have a team in place there, we can, there's a huge opportunity there. And uh, as for results, uh, of course, when you have um, consultants on spot, we, when you have onboarding on spot, it's much easier to approach the uh, customers and as, especially enterprise customers as well. So it's, there's a lot, of, lot to do with uh, this um, proof uh, that you have like the team on spot there. I know also you have incredible team culture. We have tried to hire people from you. <laughs> um, nobody wants to leave. That's What's true. the secret source <laughs> of it? Um, I agree with, uh, I don't remember who said it before, that hire on values and everything else has to be diversified. So we hire a lot on values and um, hmm. uh, we never take anyone who's excellent at their job but doesn't fit the culture. And when I say fit the culture, I don't mean that we all look alike and act alike. It's more about the values mostly, yeah. Thanks. Any questions? Yes. Uh, Mike is coming. <laughs> Yes, go to Italy. When? Good ah. question. <laughs> uh, well, you can actually use Scoro from Italy right now. So okay. uh, come on <laughs> together. <laughs> Good. Next target market in place. Any other questions to Scoro? Yes. What has been your chief new customer acquisition channel? Uh, sorry, can you repeat? Your chief customer acquisition channel, what has been? So online, oh, yeah. offline? Um, it's mainly, so basically 99.9% .9 of our uh, sales come through inbound. Uh, we use a lot wow. of digital channels. Uh, we have a sales team, but they rely on the inbound uh, leads. And uh, it's mostly uh, brand awareness and SEO. <laughs> so it has been a, um, as for anyone who starts doing SEO, it's like a big project, but it's rewarding. So yeah, currently it's, it's working for us.
you're a really talented marketing team and you have built it up. So it, it has really been a great, great job. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and next one, we have Giraffe360. Mikus, your story. Hey. Hello, everyone. I'm Mikus Oppelts, one of the founders of Giraffe360. And we are in the real estate space. Real estate is big, solid, it's physical, but it's one of those industries, the last frontier that haven't been disrupted and impacted by technology almost at all. Suddenly, it has started to shift. Real estate industry is suddenly moving into prop tech. Who of you have heard about prop tech? Not too many, but we are growing. There's like 6,000 prop tech startups in Europe just to characterize the industry. So every real estate company suddenly needs, as a standard, to start digitizing their property on a day-to-day -day basis, creating different contents, gathering data, and, and, and sort of create this, what we call in the industry, like a digital twin. But the existing technology that supports that, for example, smartphones in your pocket, they're limited, professional tools are complex, but services are expensive. So to solve this problem, we developed Draw360. Draw360 is a full package service, like a full circle technology that starts with our own camera. We design our own hardware, which is incredibly simple to use. There's literally two buttons on it. So you press one and you can create miraculous visual content and data content from environment. With a single push of the button, we promise our clients that they can do professional photography, they can do videos, they can do floor planning, they can do 3D, and they can collect data that they can then, in the long run, use for different types of analytic and, and just a property management job. So this is what we are up to. But as a business, so how we got to this point? We are a three-year-old company, less than three years, but the, probably the unique thing about us is that we started as a spin-off from our service business. Um, when I was 21, it was a long time ago, I started a service company in Latvia uh, with friends in university, to, and we decided to do virtual tours. So we bought our first Canon camera, walked around Riga, and started to do virtual tours for every single company we could find. The idea behind my first service company was that if you could see property online in a good shape and form, why you would want to waste your time on going on like the first visit? And I thought it's so obvious that everybody will want it. <laughs> Eventually, the business grew in five-star hotels, like in Tallinn, we service Schlaze, uh, Hilton, Radisson, and different like high-level interactive technologies, and grew more and more around these super high-end tools. Like we were among the first ones to do VR apps and stuff. And at one point, we started to think, OK, how do we scale this? Because the service business is becoming more like day-to-day -day individual process. You can't scale it to the global domination. And we as ambitious young guys, we wanted the global domination. So Giraffe360 actually more started as a strategy. Um, so we sat down. It is a spin-off from our original business with the goal, how do we actually convert this need, and how do we make it in a product that can work globally? And for the strategy, the first job for us was to choose our target market. And for example, hotels, they only do new photo shoot once in seven years. So there's a low retention. We wanted somewhere where somebody every day needs to capture visuals, and we chose real estate agencies. Why agencies? Because there's roughly 200,000 real estate agencies only in Europe. On average, they onboard five new properties every month. So they are going out and doing at least five photo shoots and two to three floor plans a month. So that is like more than 12 million photo shoots and, flo and more than 3 million floor plans that are done only here in Europe. Um, we chose this as our industry. And on the product level, we actually never wanted to build our own hardware. That wasn't, wasn't the idea. The idea was, let's take an iPhone and turn into this device that can 
create all these beautiful contents. We spent six months. Uh, after six months, we sat down with my brother, who's my co-founder, and he said, we have to build our own camera. How hard can it be? And like, it took me half a second to say, yeah. Like, such a rookie mistake. <laughs> uh, building hardware is slightly harder than we expected. Um, but our goal wasn't not to find the easy way how to build a business. Our goal was to how to build one scalable way. We had tested every single tool in the world. We knew there's no one out there that can do this. Either we're going to just sit here and wait, uh, or we actually go and, 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 and get things done ourselves. And now, once we are in the game, we actually love it, because in the global world, we have 2.5 competitors. In a software play, you have, I don't know, 1,000 startups per, per group, per product category. In a hardware play, investors does not love us too, as much as software guys. We are kind of meh. Uh, but once we get through, there's 2.5 competitors amongst the world. So I like my odds there. And as a business model, we chose a subscription, because I strongly believe that you have to align your value with your client's value, because the place where you're going to be charging money for your client is the place where eventually your business focus will be. So we never wanted to do like this one, one deal type of business. And we chose a, a subscription. We give away free hardware, give away free access to the whole package, and, ju and just charge a monthly or annual subscriptions to our clients. And on execution, two things I think we've done so far in these three years, which are maybe slightly off the standard. First, uh, when we started, we understood we have to build this, this new thing. Like, it would be hard. And we didn't went and not create a nice, beautiful office somewhere with a ping pongs and beers. We actually created boot camp, 250 kilometers from Riga, where we go on a boot camp rhythm. You, the previous colleague spoke about communication, where there's no communication allowed. We just sit down to execute tasks. And we spent, I think, in a year in a boot camp rhythm with all, like, <laughs> less access to the outside world. Another thing is we wanted to be in the market and not to scale from, from Riga, where we were originally from. And before we even had a product, I started to fly to London every second week. So once we are ready, we can actually scale already from a big market. So three years, what we have done, we legitimately have built the best property capture device. Uh, we believe this is the highest quality tool in the market. It's incredibly simple to use. It captures property in 270 megapixel reflection. We scan accurate floor planning. So we have built in a LiDAR laser. We gather tons of data. And we are able to give this, ca this camera to anyone in the world and say that this is the best thing on the planet. Um, second thing, we have grown to 10 countries. Uh, we service starting from small real estate agency somewhere in Ireland, Watford up to the biggest real estate players like BNP Paribas in France and in, in, in like Audi in Germany uh, and a lot of other companies. We have raised up to this point 1.6 million. Our lead investors were Coca Capital for the seed round, 500 and 1.1 million was this year announced, which was led by Change Ventures. Thank you guys for the money. If others want to give us your money, please, you're welcome. Happy to take it. Uh, as a business, uh, now we are really focused on establishing our subscriptions, but we are also collecting a tons and tons of data and, and, and building a lot of value through that data. So real estate is this physical, hard space, and we hope to be the company that makes it more digital and more accessible on our screens. Thank you, guys. Thank you. They spent too much time. No worries. All good. All good. Impressive progress on, on the hardware side. Like, it looks good. It's I remember really the first good. ones. <laughs> it's really good. They were different. Good. Yeah. Yeah. It's like we, and the thing we did different on the, on the hardware, we actually built them in our office. We have five 3D printers. We print most of the parts. And in two years, we have launched three different models. So yeah. we distribute, let's say, first 10 cameras to our clients. And since they work on the subscription, they don't have to be perfect. And we just monitor what doesn't work. And as soon as one thing we don't like, we just, we just change it. And we send to the client a new, new camera. That has allowed us in two year time, once we started to deliver, be really quick on next iterations, yeah. uh, which usually is not the case. Like, uh, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. So, so uh, my job and passion is to be investor. But investors sometimes are like such a parrot 
we repeat the same thing and all investors are telling like hardware is hard and not willing to invest. So, uh, so, so, so how was your like fundraising and, and, and what's the feedback for hardware piece and, and you know, what was wrong with change that they didn't bother about hardware? Yeah, <laughs> like the hardware is hard part. Like I don't know which part is easy. <laughs> so, so, and, and I, th I don't think that we That's are true. in this to be, e to, be, to be it easy. So we never looked for the easy way out. But to answer your hardware question, I think probably from 10 investor meetings, nine are strikeouts only because, oh, it's a hardware there. Uh, and it's, it's not even deeper look. Uh, we measure ourselves as a SaaS business. We have a great SaaS metrics. Yeah. Churn rate is zero. Once clients start using our hardware, they haven't almost never canceled our service. Uh, we have a high profitability, the, the lifetime value. So when you dive into these SaaS metrics, you actually see that, that the business has a massive potential and Makes we sense. are competing against 2.5 companies in the world. Uh, I think, but it's super hard to get past that first stage where you legitimately start to evaluate the business based on the potential just because the notion that you can't invest this hardware, it's, it's like mantra and stop doing that. <laughs> like it, it, yeah. From one hand, it actually helps us because we know that there will not be next camera company. Yeah. Uh, and and that helps us, uh, our, our odds to succeed. But your business is still like pretty unique in a sense of having software, having hardware and, and, and it's, it's, it's kind of, so you said investors, who would like to invest, you would take the money. But if you had to take advice as well, if you had a choice to pick an investor who has certain experience, what kind of experience you would look for? Wow, <laughs> million dollar question. Um, probably growth, um, global. Yeah. Uh, we will be a global business. Uh, we will operate in almost every continent in the world. And, and we want our investors to help us access a c other capital that will infuse right. that growth. And, and still B2B world is really contact driven. One yeah. introduction, like BNP Paribas is the, the Europe's biggest commercial, uh, commercial agency. And we got it through one introduction. Uh, but so it's, yeah, so those are the things that I'm looking for. Great. Any hard questions to the company that has hardware? Yes, there's one. Uh, just microphone is coming up uh, immediately, so we can hear as well. Hello. Do you create 3D models? Yes, like we, we now can create a point cloud, scan out a point cloud, and, and then we are looking how to export different geometries from those, three, from those point clouds and those measurements. Like not, it's not yet available on the functionality, but that's the next thing we are working on. Thank you. Any more questions? That, that will be need for every architect and property management company. Yes. Uh, hi, so do you also gather real estate price information? Yeah. <laughs> no, but we can merge that data. Uh, what we gather is, uh, we gather the inside of the properties, which actually doesn't have a, there's not too many things that get inside of properties because Google Street View doesn't get in there. So there's a lot of unique information of how the indoors of the world looks. But uh, price is something we can't, we can visually assess how many, I don't know, on average um, uh, light bulbs are in the buildings and who has produced those light bulbs using image recognition, which is one of our most important uh, algorithms that we are working on because one is the visual information, but then through image recognition is understanding what is in that building in. And then it becomes a really powerful tool. So you could build an AI which based on the picture and model can say, this apartment is a value of basically correlating what's inside location and so on, you can go to pricing. Uh, pricing, yes, but even more importantly, when you manage, let's say, 10,000 properties and you want to know what is, how, many you how many TVs you have installed, simple questions. Like nobody has a database because the buildings are changing mm, right. uh, and, 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 it, and, and nobody keeps the track of detail. So, for me, I think it's a pretty simple way to go in a property, push the button, and this is how you capture all your database, and then whichever information you need to access, you just search for it. I think that's even more important that we can give to our clients. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Thank you. <laughs> Next, coming up, Oxypit Deep Tech Company, Kiriminas. Hello, everyone. So can you see the slides? 
So I'm Guy Menas. I'm CEO and co-founder of Occiput. Occiput is a deep learning startup focusing on automating radiology. And uh, <clears throat> so recently I have fallen victim to uh, mobility investments. So, and by that I mean I have fallen from an electric scooter. And uh, what happened uh, was I, I went to a top trauma center in, in Lithuania and I had an x-ray taken of my arm, and uh, the radiologist didn't see anything wrong with it. So luckily, uh, the traumatologist uh, disagreed, and I had to do a CT examination in addition to that, uh, thus correcting the diagnosis. So, and uh, who is to blame here? Right, is it electric scooters? Is it radiologists? So I think it's hard to blame radiologists in, uh, in this case because uh, the number of examinations they perform has grown immensely during the last few years. So say in Lithuania, the number of MRI exams from 2006 to 2016 has grown 15 times while the number of radiologists remained steady. And uh, the number of radiologists is actually steady across all European Union, while the number of exams is growing exponentially. And uh, what is happening is that reports are decreasing in quality on x-ray exams, because um, radiologists used to spend a lot more time uh, studying how to report on them. Now they spend more time on CTs, MRIs, who are growing in importance. Uh, and also, uh, due to limited amount of time they can spend, um, essentially they are um, rushing through the reports in, in many, many countries, and they have backlogs of examinations in, uh, in tens of thousands per, per hospital in, in uh, countries such as UK. So, a toxipid, uh, what we do is trying automating certain pieces of radiology. So right now, our start of conquest of this field is from X-ray reporting, and uh, this is the largest uh, modality with about two billion X-rays taken. It, and it seems, from AI perspective, uh, a simple task, but it. It's also actually probably one of the hardest because it's a projection of 3D structures onto 2D uh, surface. Uh, radiologists make significant number of errors in judgment. Um, and also the number of uh, different things you can uh, tell from a chest actually is, is uh, about 100. So we, we built a solution uh, which is now C certified uh, for r radiological reports on chest X-rays, covering 75 different radiological findings, and um, so things uh, which helped us to do this and which uh, help us on our way um, is our excellent team. So I'm really proud to be working with these guys. So we have. Um, people like Darius Boroshauskas, who is on a um, competitive artificial intelligence and data science platform called Kaggle, which is owned by Google, um, with a total number of data scientists in about one million. He was ranked number four. He is in top, global top 10, um, with multiple um, first places in various competitions. Uh, we have Yogandas Sarmaitis, uh, who, uh, as opposed to me, had rejected offer from University of Cambridge and um, is a Marie Curie fellow. Uh, we have Jonas Bilopatravich, uh, who had been doing deep learning uh, since about 2013. And uh, me and, and Jonas and Yogandas, we were part of R&D team at Neurotechnology, which is a Lithuanian company. Uh, which does biometrics and surveillance research, and they have uh, such products 
as number one globally by accuracy, fingerprints recognition technology and, and um, retina recognition technology according to National Institute for Standards and Technology. And so this is, this is just basically our path. Uh, one of the biggest challenges is uh, getting uh, device, medical device certified. So, sorry, am I taking it a bit long? Um, time is up very soon. Okay. Maybe just a quick last slide as yeah. well. So. Yeah, so what I'm really proud about is that we didn't know how to do a C certification and everybody told us it's really, really hard. But when you focus on the hard thing and don't question it, you actually get it done. And we have quite a bit of competition. Uh, this uh, industry is heating up, uh, as you can see from the number of investments. And uh, in spite of that, I'm quite proud to be in, in the Baltics and uh, feel very, um, uh, actually, um, very sort of happy to be in the Baltics because uh, all of the help we, we receive from uh, global Lithuanian community uh, and uh, opportunities presented by the government, which, um, say, for example, allowed us to, to visit a, a Northern Future Forum and uh, chat with prime ministers of Northern countries and the UK uh, regarding the future of healthcare. Yep. And uh, yeah, so really glad to be in the Baltics. Um, I'm sorry, so I'll have to probably last, stop here. Uh, last slide is pretty cool, actually. Okay, so what is yes, it? yes. And since you haven't seen the product yet, so this is our early iteration of the product. And you can see an actually of uh, Tony Stark from Iron Man. And uh, actually, our solution here detected sternum wires, which is actually quite uh, close to what you could see, although it's uh, not really uh, a a radiological finding you could find in a natural setting. So, thank so you very much. Do you know what happened in the end game with Iron Man? Uh, Not a spoiler here, but... B yeah, I know, I know. Could, could you save him with your technology, maybe last minute? <laughs> it's sad, otherwise? <coughs> okay, l let me think about that. <laughs> I, I, I think, uh, hopefully, in a few years. <laughs> Not yeah. right now. Great. So, so products like that, quite often, uh, you know, doctors are thinking you are trying to replace doctors. Uh, yeah. Do you get that feedback? And then what's your answer? So, yeah, so we actually got that feedback, but there were two segments of doctors giving that feedback. So one segment was upset and unhappy about uh, this. The other segment was really happy about us replacing them because, I mean, they have a huge field of radiology to work with, and the x-rays is not really the most interesting part for them. Right. It's opportunity, actually. Yeah. Great. Any questions from audience? It's fairly complex technology. And, and you know, Baltic startups, um, there's something they say differently. Than, than usually you hear from US or UK. We use quite a lot of uh, trying. We are trying. In UK, in US, we are doing. <laughs> but Baltic startups are trying. And that's why maybe we are hard to give up. We try until it works. Mm -hmm. So how has been your kind of technology development? Is it like trying or it has been really smooth way, you know, to get to, to the solutions? Um, no, I, I think it's it's trying, it's a lot of trying and getting exactly. things right or wrong and then iterating, although that's quite difficult to do in healthcare. Yeah. Yeah, so. Good, thank you. Thank you very much. And our last presentation is coming from Lithuania as well. CG Trader, Arita, please. Thank you. So before we start, I would like to ask uh, who here in the audience buys online anything, whether shoes, electricity, anything? Okay. How many of you actually return products when you get them and they don't fit you? Okay. So I want to walk you through an experience how we intend to change your online shopping experience. 
So first of all, my name is Arita Matsov. I'm the Chief Marketing Officer for CG Trader, and I hope through the presentation you will understand what we do. So a short introduction as a snapshot of what we do so that we have a better communication throughout the presentation. CG Trader can transform your products into realistic 3D models for immersive AR and VR experiences, allowing your customers to immediately try your products in their home. CG Trader makes it easy, leading to increased sales, fewer returns, and improved customer satisfaction. Trust CG Trader, the company with close to 2 million designers, 10 years of customer experience, blue chip companies including Wayfair and Shopify to bring a third dimension to your online retail at any scale. CG Trader, committed to being the world's preferred source of 3D content and design expertise to fuel this transformation. Visit us now. So CG Trader, we have two business lines with our traditional marketplace where 3D designers can upload 3D models and content for others to actually download and buy this content. So the people that use 3D models and our customers are animation, gaming, and 3D printing, among others. And the other side, another segment of our business is e-commerce, which is fairly new. And the, uh, the presentation today is focusing on e-commerce. So what does it really mean? When Apple and Google came out with the AR kit and AR course, so augmented reality capabilities, it means that today all of us actually can experience images and products online in augmented reality. And the game changing here is that you do not need to download any specific applications. And so what you see here is a regular online image, usually when you go and buy something. And what we want to do, and what retailers today are looking to do, is to actually convert those to 3D images so that you, ha you can actually experience the product in your real environment. So just kind of think that you're buying a sofa, and you want to put it in your living room. When you go to the shop, how can you actually vision the end result in your living room? And with this 3D model, you can actually, on your mobile, put it in your living room, and see in the environment the size, the color, how it fits, and if you actually want to buy it. And when I asked you if you're interested, you know, how many people of you return products, the likelihood when you buy this is much smaller. So why is this important for retailers, and why are they looking to actually apply augmented reality to the online shopping experience? It's because it increases sales, one of the things is that it increases sales, but the other thing is as well that it reduces the return rates. And the additional thing is that doing 3D models is much cheaper than taking photography of all the products. So just imagine IKEA. What happens with IKEA is that uh, uh, they have tens of thousands of products. That imagine if they have to take all of those to a photography studio and take photos of them in different angles, in different positions, in different colors and shades. It's massive in time, and it's very expensive. But doing it in 3D models is instant. And so we also learned that the first adapters to actually turning their online shops to, to 3D uh, and AR experience are uh, the home decor and furniture shops. So why aren't they doing it? because it's still it's complex and uh, you need specific skills to do it. Uh, you need special uh, hardware and software as well as uh, it's very time consuming, like I told you, and to scale is very difficult. So imagine if you have 20 products is one thing, but if you have 10,000 products or 100,000 products to scale and get those all designed in 3D is very uh, uh, um, problematic. So like I told you, our original business is the marketplace where we have about 2 million 3D designers. This is our community that can work with all the retailers that are interested in uh, changing their products into 3D models. And it's a growing community. We have established this in the last uh, about eight years. And like I said, we have about eight million, uh, uh, 2 million um, 3D designers. So what's the opportunity? The opportunity, we have selected a couple of uh, names here, I think familiar to all of us. 
And just thinking about their products and SKUs, how many there are that actually should and could be converted to AR experience. So this is a 100 million uh, uh, opportunity just in the furniture. And we, when we take this and uh, convert it to um, uh, what it means to us as CG trader, so you take the 100, uh, 100 million that I just showed you, let's say it's about $100 Per, per product, it's a 10 million opportunity uh, just there in the uh, furniture and home decor category. There are, of course, many others, and uh, no doubt we're going to move there as well. So we believe we're in a very good position also from the management perspective. The company has 70 people. The, the uh, headquarters are in Lithuania. We have a small subsidiary now in Israel. It's a combination of people that come, like Marius, our uh, co-founder, who is actually a 3D designer himself. We have Dali, our CEO, who has been uh, many years in the tech startups. And we have uh, Maureen, uh, who is our VP uh, sales, 20-plus uh, years in sales. I just joined uh, three months ago with a 25-plus uh, years of experience in marketing, in different uh, executive marketing roles and others. So we feel very... Uh, comfortable uh, that we can take uh, this opportunity and add and extend our business from the marketplace also to the enterprise. And of course, we are backed by uh, Karma, uh, Intel and uh, Praktika investors. Thank you very much. Thank you, Arita. You joined quite lately yes. and Maureen as well, head of sales. But after you both joined, sales really started to accelerate. Is there a correlation between you joining and, you know, sales starting to heavily go up? So I would, of course, like to say yes. But uh, when I came to the company, I saw that uh, the, the team and uh, the people had really realized this opportunity and were really open for additional uh, uh, talent and people that had done this before, taking the company from, let's say, this stage to actually penetrating a new, totally new, uh, market uh, was very open, and I think we've done uh, some uh, significant steps to, to move that business forward. Because it's B2C and B2B is very different, and you need to know how to actually uh, uh, penetrate the market like that. In your experience, you have like built small companies, underdog to major players in, in global scene, and, and last job, you know, in Stratasys, you had thousands of employees, you know, in the company, big company, and now you're based in Tel Aviv, having WeWork desk and, and having a team of five in Tel Aviv and, of course, majority team in, 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 in Lithuania. How it feels to join a small, really small company again? Right. So my career has really uh, always been that I have started in smaller companies in different sizes. And I like it much more because it's actually being there to be able to build something big, make an impact, rather than to be in these big companies uh, you know, kind of uh, doing more of the same. I mean, you always have something interesting. So this is my passion, my heart, and I'm uh, very excited about working for CG Trader and the opportunity. Really happy to have you. Um, any questions? One question we could, we could still take. We are a bit of over time. Um, if not, then Arita. There is one I, question. Th there is one. Okay, yeah. Thank you. So what is CG Trader's chief competitive advantage that would prevent others from stealing your market share eventually? So first of all, I think we're very lucky that uh, it's a green field. And we were the first one to realize this opportunity. And uh, we don't see the others that are actually players like in the marketplace, not yet in this uh, B2B. So we have a um, first uh, come advantage for sure. And what we're doing uh, a lot is making sure that we actually shape the conversation what this market and industry should look like. So we take part in all these uh, uh, retail uh, augmented reality uh, uh, events. We have one coming uh, end of the month where we talk to top uh, 50 US media and uh, the retailers themselves. And we take keynotes uh, to make sure that uh, we, uh, we shape the conversation. Thank you. Thank you again. Thank you.